Hello, everybody, in this vast room. Um, we are going to be sure that there are no fire emergencies while you are here, because I'm sure that we're under the maximum occupancy level here, but only maybe just barely. So um, while the last people are grabbing their lunches, I want to make a few announcements. I'm Hadar Harris. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Today's event is sponsored both by the Center and the International Legal Studies Program, and we are so pleased to see all of you here today. Um, we're sorry that we're a little cramped. Um, there were, there, as, as you all know, A, it's Wellness Day. So we know that you are extremely interested in the topic at hand because you're not getting free massages here uh, and instead are, are interested in litigating in, in indigenous rights. Um, and we definitely appreciate that. Um, also, I'm sure the burrito bar was definitely a full. Fergus, it wasn't. They didn't come for the food. Um, but I want to make a couple of announcements about events that are upcoming because uh, if, you, if you think today is fun, and it is, um, uh, we have some more things to keep you busy. Um, tomorrow, Thursday, at 5.30, the 12th annual Human Rights Film Series will launch with the first screening of a series of four films. Juan, there's a seat for you, or there's a seat for you there. But we, wherever you would like, sorry. Um, um, we saved you one near the air conditioner. It's a primo seat. Um, uh, and one day, you will get a seat saved for you too. Um, uh, the 12th Annual Human Rights Film Series. This is uh, uh, Look at the Environment and Human Rights Week around the center. So today we're talking about litigating indigenous rights. Tomorrow night we're going to talk about eco-terrorism. Um, the first film in our film series is called If a Tree Falls, a story of the Earth Liberation Front. I'm not making a linkage between indigenous rights and eco-terrorism. I want to just make that clear. Um, it's a really fascinating film that starts at 5.30 up at the Katzen Center. This is a series that we do in collaboration with all of the deans of all of the, of the various schools at American University and in conjunction specifically with the Center for Social Media. We'll have four screenings over the next month. You can find this postcard and posters around. I think there's a big one in color in the lobby with a golden star on it, or there will be soon, that, that shows you which film is screening which week. So take a look at it. I apologize, there is no popcorn because the Katzen Center will not let us have popcorn in the screening room. But please come to that. Also, um, the registration is now closed, but on Friday, how many of you are joining us for the visit to the Holocaust Museum? We have 40 people signed up to go down to the Holocaust Museum um, and to take a tour there and to talk with one of their scholars in residence. Um, and it's the first of a series of site visits that the Center for Human Rights is, is uh, putting together this uh, this year. If you uh, still want to join us, meet us at 1 o'clock at the Holocaust Museum at the entrance there. That's when we'll be giving our tour there. Finally, last thing, there is an event evaluation form. This doesn't put pressure on you, Fergus. It's okay. Um, don't talk about how crowded and hot the room is. We know that already. But we'd like to get your input. We'd like to get your feedback. Um, and, and as always, your input and involvement in what we do is very, very important. So. At that moment, I would like to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, David Hunter. Uh, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, I am David Hunter. Welcome, all of you. It's great to see so many people here. And um, I do want, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why we're building a new school eventually, because um, we don't have enough space to, to uh, accommodate all the great events that take place here. Um, I'll be very brief. I want to uh, just introduce uh, a colleague of mine for many years and a friend, Fergus McKay, who's um, been a tremendous leader in the uh, uh, movement for human rights and indigenous rights and environmental protection around the world. And it's a great honor for me to have him here. Uh, Fergus is a, a senior counsel at an organization in the United Kingdom called the Forest People's Program. You can go on their website and uh, learn about it and donate. Um, he's also uh, has been previously the legal advisor to the World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Um, he's litigated a number of, of, of cases um, and advocated a number of different forums, including uh, in the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. And that's what we're going to hear about uh, today, some of his experiences uh, litigating. I should also say we're going to be somewhat efficient because I understand that um, 
37 20 to go uh, get a sonogram on it for the first child. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a, a, as well a great scholar and an activist, one of those two that blends the world, has done a lot of writing in this area. Uh, and it's really an honor to have him back at the school. He's been here, I know, at least once before. And, and uh, for this, the floor is yours. Thank you. School, we didn't get free lunch, so I guess we were, we were all very lucky. Um, I, I'm going to talk about uh, one case in particular, which is called the Saramaka People versus Suriname case, which was decided by the American Court in uh, November 2007. Um, but before I do that, uh, I just want to give you an idea of the type of um, human rights slash environment issues that I come across in my work, and they break down broadly into two different categories. Does this thing go like this? No? Anybody know how this works? There we okay. go. All right. Um, so the, the main category is, is the rights of individuals, but in my work more so. You may need to speak into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry about that. So the, the main area in which I work is the rights of individuals, but more so the rights of collectives, in particular indigenous peoples, but not exclusively, uh, in the context especially of extractive industries, mining, oil, logging, uh, and increasingly now dams and also agro-industry. Oil palm, in particular, in Indonesia and Malaysia, is becoming uh, quite a major problem, particularly with uh, a lot of the grow-your-own fuel stuff going on at the moment. Um, we found that growing your own fuel, f uh, fuel tends to mean other people can't grow their own food, uh, which obviously raises all kinds of human rights issues uh, for, a, for a whole range of different people. Um, the second major area, I think, is how development activities. Uh, affect people and how, from a human rights perspective, development activities can or should take place. Um, should there be environmental and social impact assessments? If so, how? What, what should be part of that process? Should there be an explicit human rights impact assessment as part of that, or is it implicit in the social impact assessment? Uh, if we do a purely environmental impact assessment, we would tend to come up with very different conclusions than if it had a social or an explicit human rights uh, impact assessment component to it. Um, benefit sharing. Are people benefiting from these projects or are they experiencing primarily the negative impacts whereas others are experiencing the benefits? Uh, often in cases involving indigenous peoples we see the costs being externalized onto indigenous peoples whereas people usually in cities or, or urban centers enjoy the benefits. This is particularly the case with dams, which are becoming much more um, popular again these days, usually under the guise of clean energy. Uh, my personal opinion is dams are not as clean as they're made out to be, and certainly not in human terms. Um, are there certain situations where no project is allowed? The government wants to desperately build a dam somewhere. Are there human rights norms that say you cannot build that dam because of the impact on the affected people? Well, I think in certain cases there are, uh, and that's actually borne out to some extent in the jurisprudence as well. Um, we also then have what uh, some call positive environmental protection measures, establishing national parks, for instance. To what extent does the establishment of a national park need to comply with human rights norms? Does it? Is there an exception? Does a public interest exception override the rights of the people who live in that area and who may be subject to involuntary restrictions on their use of resources in that area. Uh, this, I think, is, is a, a very important area that hasn't been dealt with properly in the human rights jurisprudence. Uh, and actually, there is a case now in the inter-American system that directly addresses that, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of this presentation, because it's also one of the cases that I'm working on now. Um, I think the other major area is what is the interaction between human rights norms and environmental protection instruments or environmental law instruments like the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, the Ramsar Convention, uh, and then crossing over into things like the policies of international financial institutions like the World Bank or the International Finance Corporation, uh, and then even into private sector bodies that are setting standards for their members like the International Council on Metals and Mining. Um, and others as well. Right? 
So I think those are sort of the main areas where I do I deal with in my work. There's both those who are suffering from projects that cause environmental problems, and then there's in, international policy looking at uh, environmental protection measures. In climate change, for instance, there's a big debate going on about protecting forests as a way of mitigating climate change, as a way of storing and capturing carbon. Uh, most of these projects actually are on indigenous people's lands, and many indigenous peoples feel that they're being punished for protecting their forests. So they're not only not having their rights recognized, but their rights are being restricted in the name of protecting the global environment when they're not the ones causing the majority of the pollution in the first place, uh, and they're the ones who protected these lands, so there are still standing forests on these lands, so they feel they're getting a double whammy in a way. Uh, the same type of discussion revolves around protected areas too. A lot of indigenous people feel victimized for protecting their lands, which are then converted into national parks, which they're no longer allowed to go hunting in, or go fishing in, or go visit their sacred sites. And uh, in some cases, we have quite severe human rights abuses, tortures, killings. Uh, I just came back from Cameroon, where a certain organization who has a panda on its logo has been burning down indigenous people's houses in a national park. Uh, this is not what gets put on TV in most countries when they try and get $25 out of everybody, right? So just the background to the Saramaka case. It was a complaint filed in 2000, uh, following three years of meetings with the Saramaka in uh, some 70 communities up and down a river in the middle of a tropical rainforest in Suriname. Very hard place to get to. Um, there were so many meetings because the Saramaka had, uh, if they'd heard of the inter-American system, didn't know what it was. Uh, so needed a lot of discussion in order to themselves decide what they thought the best options were for trying to deal with their problems. And their problems were caused primarily by Chinese logging companies, but not exclusively. So there were three years of discussions amongst all of these communities on do you want to file a case, do you want to do this, do you want to do that, and eventually they decided that they had no option but to file a case with the inter-American system. Uh, in the process, they also made some pretty detailed maps of their territory and how they used the resources in their territory as a way of explaining to others what the impact of these concessions were on them. Um, was this going automatically? No, you could have it. Yeah. So th this is a hearing before the Inter-American Commission uh, where these maps of Saramaka territory are being explained to the then commissioners. Uh, they were very helpful tools in explaining this because we found trying to do it verbally didn't work very well. So having pictures that showed where the concessions were and where people went hunting and fishing and farming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, and how they were affected by those concessions was the best way of explaining this to people. Um, some of whom are incredibly intelligent people, but don't have much of an idea how people who live in a tropical forest go about their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So the Inter-American Commission adopted its decision in March 2006 uh, and submitted the case to the Inter-American Court in June 2006. Uh, it gave Suriname uh, four months within which to implement its recommendations, and the state failed to even respond to the commission within that four-month period. Uh, so they then submitted the case to the court. Uh, if you want to read the decision of the commission, uh, there's the web link there. I think it's probably the only place you can find it since they didn't publish the, uh, the report that the commission adopted. Um, the commission's report is about 300 paragraphs long, and I'm going to summarize the whole thing in one paragraph. So <laughs> if you want more information, I suggest you read, to read the whole thing. Um, and I've cherry-picked one particular issue out of this, which is that the uh, uh, view of the Commission is that human rights neither discourage nor prevent development, but set the conditions by which development shall take place. Uh, in particular, development activities have to be accompanied by appropriate and effective measures uh, to guarantee that they're not conducted at the expense of the rights of individuals or groups, uh, or at the expense of the environment on which they depend. Uh, for their physical, cultural, and spiritual well-being. I think these uh, three different categories are actually very important because a lot of people will not comprehend or even sometimes see one of these, uh, particularly the spiritual aspect of this. Uh, for many indigenous people's relationship to land is expressed through spiritual and cultural 
and other non-tangible means. Uh, and oftentimes, particularly when we see impact assessments, these things tend not to be properly understood or they're underestimated or mischaracterized. So before the court, the Saramaka and the Commission uh, asserted violations of Article 21, which is the right to property, uh, Article 25, which is the right to judicial remedies, uh, Article 1 and 2, which are implementation of the Convention, their basic uh, provisions, and then Article 3, which is the right to juridical personality. Uh, the Commission did not argue Article 3. It was the victim's representatives who argued a violation of Article 3, which we're now allowed to do so under the new rules of the court. So if the Commission had processed this case previously, Article 3 would not have been part of this case. Uh, what is the facts of the case? Well, Suriname granted about three rather large logging concessions to Chinese logging companies starting in 1996. Uh, the Saramaka were not even notified that these concessions had been granted. They found out about it when they saw bulldozers in the forest knocking trees down. Uh, and about 4,000 Chinese people with chainsaws and started wondering what's going on here. So they went to talk to them and they were told that if you interfere with these operations, you'll all be arrested and put in jail. And we have permission from the government, so if you don't like it, we'll talk to them. Uh, in Suriname, there are no judicial remedies by which the Saramaka could challenge the grants of these logging concessions, or the manner in which the logging took place in the concessions, which was essentially clear cutting. So they cut down all the trees and then they left the stuff that wasn't worth anything and took away the commercially valuable trees. In the process, they destroyed farms that the Saramaka used to produce food for six to eight months at a time. So there were a number of Saramaka communities who were basically without food for six to eight months and had to go beg their relatives for food which is considered extremely degrading in Saramaka culture. It's very shameful to have to rely on others. Uh, in Suriname, the law says the state owns all land unless you have a title from the state. And the only form of title that's issued is what they call land lease, which is a lease of state <coughs> land for 15 to 40 years. Uh, and through no fault of their own, the Saramaka has no titles. Uh, in fact, they're ineligible to obtain title because they don't have collective legal personality. Um, and because the state only issues title to individuals. So it's in fact impossible for the Santa Market to obtain title even if they were to apply for one. Um, and again, the last bit is the, the failure to recognize the legal personality of the Saramaka as a collective. Um, some people think this is a technical lawyer thing, but it is actually fundamental to human rights. If you don't have legal personality, you're incapable of holding rights, incapable of enforcing those rights. So even if the Saramaka were to one day try to acquire a title, there's no way of actually vesting that title in them because they're invisible in the eyes of the law in Suriname. It actually undermines every other right that they hold as a collective. Why is Saramaka important? I and mean, this is my own, uh, my own take on why it's important. Um, it's the first time the Inter-American Court has in any detail applied human rights norms to how development activities will take place that may affect indigenous or tribal peoples, and I'll explain the difference between indigenous and tribal in a minute. Um, the Commission has dealt with a number of cases that have looked at this before, but it's the first time that the Court has actually done it, and done it in any detail. Uh, it affirmed that indigenous and tribal peoples have a right to consent, a right to say yes or no under certain circumstances to whether there is development that affects their lands and territories. Uh, affirmed that indigenous peoples have a right to self-determination and then applied that right in the context of property rights under the American Convention. So what does that mean in terms of right to govern territory through their own institutions, through their own legal norms and their own systems? Do they have such a right? If so, how does it work? How does it then interact with the fact that they live within a state that has its own legal system, its own laws? Um, and Suriname's objection, obviously, is they're creating a state within a state by applying such norms to the Saramaka. And we can't have states within a state because, among other things, we're a unitary state. And you're undermining the sovereignty of the state by recognizing such rights. Um, I think you can look around the world, including this country, and see that you can have more than one sovereign entity within a sovereign state uh, without too many difficulties. 
the way it works in this country is somewhat peculiar, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's another issue. Um, it basically required the recognition of the Saramaka as a people, as in all peoples have the right to self-determination, even though they didn't explicitly say so. Uh, and this is the juridical personality question. So rights vested in the Saramaka must be vested in the Saramaka people rather than a village or some sub-entity of the Saramaka or as an aggregation of individuals, which is often the case. Uh, they required mandatory benefit sharing under the theory that granting concessions on Saramaka lands was a restriction of their property rights and therefore they had a right to be compensated for it, but they expressed it as a mandatory benefit sharing requirement, which is very important because often these projects take place without any form of benefit going to the people whose lands are disrupted or worse by the, uh, by the operation. Um, I think very importantly it highlighted certain aspects of the Convention on Biological Diversity as part of uh, thinking through the human rights implications of this. In particular they said that the Aquacon guidelines on impact assessments should be part of the process of assessing impacts on indigenous peoples and tribal peoples when these projects take place on their territories. To my mind, this is the first time that they've actually done this in a human rights case, and for me, it opens up all kinds of possibilities, given that there's no enforcement mechanism at the Convention on Biological Diversity. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but it's something that's worth thinking about in, in more detail. Um, recognize that indigenous property rights include natural resources, not only within their territories, but under their territories. So potentially including subsoil resources as well. Um, but the court said those resources must be traditionally used in order to be part of those property rights. Uh, so most indigenous peoples have not traditionally used crude oil, uh, which would then be excluded. Uh, some indigenous peoples have used gold, but many haven't. So the question then becomes, well, which particular resource are we talking about, and is there any proof that they've traditionally used or not traditionally used? In the case of the Saramaka, they have been doing small-scale logging since 1760s, and in fact their right to do so was guaranteed in treaties concluded with the Dutch back in the 1760s. So the court had no problem in saying that the forests within Saramaka territory belong to the Saramaka as part of their property rights. The question then comes, well, what happens if people haven't been doing that? Do they not own the trees on their land? If we're talking about the creation of uh, carbon markets, where people are trading carbon stored in trees. Do indigenous peoples own the carbon in the trees on their land? I mean, there's a lot of complicated questions that come out of this. In my view, the court didn't deal with this very well. I think it would have been better to say if it's in an indigenous territory, it belongs to the indigenous peoples rather than going through this complicated process. At the same time, the court is aware that Ecuador, for instance, gets 60% of its GDP from oil. Uh, and if you're going to be an inter-American court, you need to have states to talk to. And if you're going to tell those states that uh, you don't own any of the resources on which your entire economy is based, you're probably not going to have a lot of people to talk to anymore. Um, the last thing is that the court built on the 2005 Moiwana Village case, which is another case of concern uh, in extending the indigenous rights framework to what they call tribal peoples. Uh, now, some people have interpreted this to mean that any community therefore has the same rights as indigenous peoples, or even that Afro-descendants all have the same rights as indigenous peoples. Um, I, I would very much caution against thinking about it in that way, uh, for reasons we'll talk about in a minute, but also because it's incredibly harmful to indigenous peoples as well, and we see this play out in the World Bank, for instance. Uh, in private sector discussions where companies say, you know, we don't mind this stuff for indigenous peoples, but if you start talking about everybody else, then there's no way we're going to agree to any of this, right? Um, I think the judgment's also important because it's been followed by the Human Rights Committee um, in a very important case called Angela Poma Poma versus Peru in 2009, uh, and very heavily by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in a case called Enderoys which was about forced evictions from uh, protected areas in Kenya. Uh, it's also been heavily cited by the constitutional courts in Colombia and Peru. Uh, in fact, the new cons uh, consultation law adopted in Peru is very much based on uh, the Saramaka judgment. Uh, and also courts in Costa Rica, Ecuador, Paraguay, Argentina, and Chile. I've even seen it cited by courts in Indonesia. So it's, it's getting around. Uh, as you can tell, <laughs> 
these are not indigenous peoples as that term is understood in the Americas. Um, the Saramaka are in fact the descendants of slaves who fought themselves free from plantations uh, established during the colonial era in Suriname and have been living in the forest for the past two to three hundred years. Uh, they have treaties with the Dutch which guaranteed their rights to own their territory and to govern themselves through their own institutions. Uh, until the 1960s, the Dutch were discussing whether the Saramaka were a separate state, citizens, allies. What are these people? They didn't know what to do with them, right? Um, Saramaka land tenure is based upon collective ownership, which is vested in matrilineal kinship groups. Uh, they very much in all ways live as other indigenous peoples do. Uh, their relationship to land and territory is as strong and fundamental as it is with most indigenous peoples. Um, this is part of the reason why I would caution against extending uh, the decision in Saramaka to any other non-indigenous group. I don't think that's what the court was doing. They were saying we have this limited category of tribal peoples who are not indigenous but in all other ways should be treated pretty much the same because their way of life, relationship to land, the rights affected are essentially the same as indigenous peoples. Um, again, there are some who are saying because these guys are Afro-descendants, we should extend all these rights to Afro-descendants as well. So that would include Barack Obama, the rest of communities in Jamaica, the Saramaka, and all points in between. I'm pretty sure a lot of them don't want a collective rights framework applied to them because it's, in some people's view, tantamount to communism. Uh, among other reasons, it's not appropriate in the first place, right? So I would very much caution against extending it too far. Right? Um, Saramaka were awarded the Goldman Environment Prize in 2009, what some people call the Environmental Nobel Prize, um, mostly Goldman, I think, <laughs> for the Central and South America region, um, primarily because they established a precedent that not only applies to them, but actually applies from Alaska to uh, Tierra del Fuego. So throughout the Americas and the Caribbean, this precedent now applies to uh, any project that would affect indigenous and tribal lands, how that works in states that haven't ratified the American Convention remains to be seen, but the principles are basically the same. So what did the judgment actually say? Um, well, obviously the state was found to be in violation of its obligations under Article 21, 25, 1, 2, and 3, and the court ordered that Suriname had to recognize Saramaka ownership rights, over their traditional territory and had to secure those rights through the adoption of laws or amending laws that may conflict with those rights and through a process of delimitation, demarcation, and titling of Saramaka territory. Now in the case of Suriname, that requires not only wholesale revising large parts of its legislation, but also adopting new laws and possibly even uh, constitutional provisions as well. Um, I think it's very important to recognize that the delimitation, demarcation, and titling is not based on what the state thinks the Saramaka should have, but is grounded in Saramaka customary law and Saramaka traditional tenure. So the starting point for figuring out what lands belong to the Saramaka is Saramaka law itself. Now how this plays out in all its details through the process remains to be seen, particularly in Suriname. Uh, but the starting point is not what the state thinks the Saramaka should have. It's what the Stats Aramaka know to be their lands in accordance with their own laws, customs, and traditions. Uh, and I can tell you from discussions with Suriname is the two are very different. Uh, Suriname's idea is drawing two and a half kilometer circles around each Saramaka community, whereas Saramaka territory, as they understand it, is something like 12,000 square kilometers. They're very, very different ideas of uh, the area involved. Um, the self-determination aspect is that recognition of Saramaka territorial rights has to include recognition of their rights to effectively control and manage and distribute their territory through their own institutions and in accordance with their own laws and customs. So in a sense, the court has not explicitly said so, but it has recognized that the Saramaka have a right to govern themselves through their own institutions, to manage their own lands, and to effectively control their territory. I think this is very important because a lot of people actually miss this aspect of this case. Uh, and I, to me, this is one of the more important aspects of this case. And I think it is very far-reaching implications uh, in, in all parts of the Americas, not, not, not just Suriname. Uh, 
Um, obviously, the state has to establish effective domestic remedies, judicial remedies, by which the Saramaka can go to court and enforce their rights should they need to do so. <coughs> has to recognize their collective juridical personality as a people for the purposes of vesting title and, and uh, seeking enforcement of their rights if they need to as well. It also has to adopt laws to ensure the right of the Saramaka to effectively participate in de decisions that may affect their territory. Uh, and that includes the right to say yes or no to certain uh, interventions in their territory. If the state wants to build a dam, for instance, it'll have to go through a process of discussing this with the Saramaka. Uh, and if it meets the criteria, the Saramaka have a right to say yes or no to whether that dam is built in their territory. Uh, this is quite a radical notion in many countries in the Americas. And in fact, Brazil just withdrew a large chunk of its money from the Inter-American Commission because the Inter-American Commission asked it to hold off on building a dam called the Belamonte Dam, which will affect a very large number of people, indigenous and non-indigenous. Uh, and Brazil was outraged by this and has actually withdrawn a large chunk of its money from the Inter-American Commission because of it. The court for better or worse, view development activities as, as a subordination of property rights. Uh, and this is grounded in the American Convention, which recognizes a right to property, but also recognizes that the state may restrict or expropriate property in the public interest. Uh, now, this is normal in every country, whether it's called eminent domain or whatever it happens to be. If the state wants to build a power line or a road or whatever it is, it can compulsorily acquire people's property. Um, the problem in the case of indigenous peoples is a public interest test is essentially a majority rules test. And if you were to apply that test in Suriname to the Saramaka, they would lose every single time if it was just based purely on the government's idea of what's in the public interest. So the court actually went beyond that and said, if we look at human rights norms, are there restrictions on when the state may exercise its prerogative to subordinate property or may restrict its eminent domain powers? Normally when I have these discussions, there's always some lawyer who goes eminent domain, eminent domain, as if it's a trump. They can pull it out and whack, eminent domain means they can do anything they like. Well, it doesn't in this context, right? So this is just the text of the, uh, the provision here. So this applies to indigenous and non-indigenous peoples when we're talking about restrictions to property rights. Uh, it has to be previously established by law, it has to be necessary, it has to be proportionate. Uh, and it has to be to fulfill a compelling public interest. So if we were to apply that to establishment of a national park, for instance, what type of conclusions may, may we arrive at? Uh, I've always had an argument that it's not necessary to expropriate indigenous people's property to establish a national park. You can achieve the same conservation goals without stripping people's rights away in the process. Uh, this seems to be a rather strange notion for a lot of people out here. The court went further than this and said, that applies to everybody else. In the case of indigenous and tribal peoples, there are additional factors that have to be considered as well. Uh, in particular, the court said that there should be uh, an evaluation of the extent to which such an activity may affect their survival as a group or as individuals within that group. And it's important to understand that there was an interpretation judgment in this case where the court explained some of these terms. Uh, and it did so partly because Suriname came back and said, we haven't killed anybody, what are you talking about? We haven't done anything wrong. Nobody's dead. So the court felt like it needed to explain that survival in this context didn't just mean killing people. So it explained, and I'll, I'll read you this bit, the survival in this context means the ability to preserve, protect, and guarantee the special relationship that they have with their territory so that they may continue living their traditional way of life and that their distinct cultural identity, social structure, economic system, customs, beliefs, and traditions are respected, guaranteed, and protected. Now, I've highlighted the word traditional because I don't really like what the court's done with this. It, it's, in my view, applying this, this loincloth idea of indigenous peoples. Uh, indigenous peoples live in the modern world just like anybody else, and indigenous peoples have phones like other people. Uh, this is sort of saying that indigenous people's rights are protected to the extent that they go hunting with bows and arrows, uh, and things like that. Now that just simply doesn't match up with reality in most indigenous communities around the world today. 
for a variety of reasons, people have become accustomed to uh, technology and other things and do not live uh, the way they did 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, nor does anybody else for that matter. Uh, and in my view, it's discriminatory to apply such a standard to indigenous peoples. They're saying indigenous peoples can't develop and must be frozen at a certain point in time in order to uh, have their rights guaranteed. So I think this is an area where we perhaps need to pick away a bit at the court in, in some of these decisions. Now, the court broke down this notion of survival in saying, in order to ensure survival, the states have to do four different things. One is it has to ensure effective participation in relation to a development or investment project. Uh, the Saramaka must receive a reasonable benefit, and the term reasonable obviously is based on the nature of the project, etc., etc. Uh, there must be independent social and environmental impact assessments. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit more later because a lot of the decisions, of the, the, the crucial decisions identified by the court are in fact dependent on the impact assessment process. So if the impact assessment process goes wrong or is not done properly uh, or excludes indigenous people's particip participation in the impact assessment process, we can get very wrong answers to a lot of these crucial questions that the court says has to be resolved. And the final thing is the state has to implement safeguards and other mechanisms to ensure that the activities themselves do not have a significant impact uh, on their territories. So this is the mitigation idea. If you're going to do these things, you have to make sure you're not polluting the water, you're not doing this, you're not doing that as well. Right? And those mechanisms must be effective, which means that you have to show that they're actually doing what they were uh, designed to do. The idea that projects may not threaten the survival of a people, uh, in my mind, implies that certain projects are not permissible. And the project that does do that would be impermissible under this test. This has actually been followed by the Human Rights Committee, again in this Peru case, although using the idea of proportionality. So if a project has disproportionate effects that affect the survival of the people, then the project is not permissible itself. Uh, it's also implicit in Article 27, which is the minority rights provision, which says uh, in members of minorities shall not be denied their right to culture. So it's a threshold test. Uh, if it crosses the line between an interference and a denial, denials are prohibited, You're not allowed to do it. Right? This, this is one of my favorite subjects. I spend days and months and years talking about this stuff. Um, according to the court, effective participation has to be broken down into the following. And this is always required, no matter what. So it has to commence in the earliest stages of the project. Now, when is that? Is that the feasibility study? Is it the impact assessment? When does it start? Uh, we have this discussion with the World Bank all the time, which has these very defined stages in its project processing. Uh, it has to be conducted in conformity with indigenous people's customs and traditions. This is a very important point. Uh, I've often been to consultations where people are dragged in from the jungle to a room like this, uh, and after an hour, ask whether they agree or don't agree to something. And oftentimes they don't even know exactly what they're doing there and spent the whole time looking at the lights because they haven't seen the lights before. Right? Um, they have to be undertaken in good faith. That means the state has not predetermined the outcome before it starts talking with people. And it has to be done with the objective of reaching an agreement. So the objective of these consultations has to be to reach an agreement. Now, it's not always easy to prove that the objective was or wasn't, but uh, there are ways of thinking that thing through, right? Uh, must ensure that indigenous peoples are aware of the risks, including environmental and health risks, so that they may knowingly accept the project. This is the informed component. People can't agree to something if they don't understand what it is, right? Uh, includes a duty on the state or those authorized by the state to share and receive information and constant communication between the parties as well, not a one-off meeting. There has to be a mechanism established by which there can be ongoing and regular communication, which includes getting access to documents. Uh, I have represented communities who are facing very large mining projects who are told they're not allowed to see impact assessments because they're confidential. And they go, well, how do you want us to agree to this project or not if we don't even know what the impacts might be? Uh, and very importantly, indigenous peoples have a right to choose their own representatives to participate in these processes. 
Uh, one of the problems we had in the Saramaka case is the state insisted that the only person it would talk to was the paramount chief of the Saramaka. Whereas under Saramaka customary law, that paramount chief has no right to decide anything. It's the clans who own land that have a right to decide. So really the people they should have been talking to were the heads of the landowning clans and not the paramount chief. Uh, the paramount chief was also getting a salary of 500 something a month from the government as well, so he was uh, oftentimes inclined to uh, see the government's view of things as well. Right? Um, is there a duty to accommodate? If there's a consultation process and indigenous people say X, Y, or Z, does that have to be factored into the project planning in the implementation phase? Do they have to change the project design based on these consultation processes? If not, it's kind of an empty discussion. Uh, and oftentimes we're told that consultation is non-binding, meaning we'll sit down and talk to you, but we don't have to do what you say. And we then think, well, why would we spend time talking to you then? Um, the court has not explicitly addressed this so far in its jurisprudence. The Inter-American Commission, however, has. Uh, in a very good report it wrote at the end of December 2009 on Indigenous Peoples' Rights to Lands and Territories. Um, the Commission, in, in common with the Canadian Supreme Court, which may be where they got it from, uh, says that there is a duty to accommodate, which means that the state has a duty to adjust or even cancel the plan or project based on input from indigenous peoples. And interestingly, it ties this to both the good faith requirement in the consultation <coughs> process and the right to due process. It says that if indigenous peoples' uh, concerns are not incorporated into the process, it may actually violate due, due process guarantees in the American system. Uh, I think that's perhaps a very interesting way of moving forward with some of this discussion. Um, some projects have a higher degree of participation, so instead of consultation with the objective of reaching an agreement, in some projects, agreement is actually required. Or to use the UN terminology, free prior and informed consent is required. FPIC. It used to just be consent, but it gets manipulated so much, people feel the need to start tacking words on the front of it. So it was then informed consent, and then it became prior informed consent, and now it's free prior and informed consent. And I have friends in the Philippines who have about six other acronyms they'd like to tack on it as well. Um, which, what kind of projects? Well, the court says that projects requiring consent are large-scale projects that may have a major or significant impact <coughs> within Saramaka territory. Uh, it also used other language, major development or investment plans that may have a profound impact on the property rights of members of the Sarah market to a large part of their territory. Uh, most people read this and don't read the interpretation judgment, which actually has a reformulation of it, which I think is the one the court is going to use in the future. Um, there the court says the test really is whether a large-scale project could affect the integrity of whoever's lands and territories. Now, we don't know what that means. We all know judges are not hugely helpful most of the time. This is another example of judges not being hugely helpful. Uh, I mean, you can stick a pin in someone and affect their integrity, or you can cut off their arm and affect their integrity. Where, where is it? Which is it? But I think this is the right standard to be applied, and I think this is the one the court is going to use rather than all the other stuff. But it def definitely has to be a large-scale project. So where is the actual line? Well, we know it has to be large-scale. Could affect the integrity. Now, I looked up the word integrity in a dictionary, just because I was curious as how a dictionary defines integrity. Uh, and it says that it's the quality of being whole, complete, unimpaired, and undivided. Uh, I also didn't find that hugely helpful either. But <laughs> it's more helpful than just the word, I think. Um, does there have to be a major, significant, or profound impact? Does it have to be over a large part of the territory? Um, I know from the arguments that were presented in the interpretation judgment that the court has essentially discarded that large part of the territory component. So it doesn't have to be a large part of the territory anymore. At least that's my idea. Um, the court in the interpretation judgment also said we need to look at the cumulative impacts of small-scale projects. There may be 20 small-scale projects that cause more harm than one large-scale project. Uh, and that's been my experience a lot of places. Small-scale mining in particular 
uh, cumulatively often causes more problems than one large-scale industrial mine does for a variety of reasons, not always, but often. So the court said we need to look at the cumulative impact of existing and future small-scale projects as well. Uh, both, I think, are very important clarifications. Uh, the court is presently deciding a case against Ecuador um, involving the Sariaku people in the Ecuadorian Amazon uh, who've been affected by oil exploration in their territory for years and years. Uh, it's the first time the court is going to apply and elaborate what it decided in Saramaca, so it's a very important judgment that's coming out uh, hopefully in November this year, but if not, January, February next year, depending on how long they want to uh, argue about the judgment. So I think we can uh, look at that and hopefully learn a bit more about what the court is planning on doing with all of this. Human Rights Committee has also followed this, again in this case on Peru in 2009. Um, importantly, the Human Rights Committee says that in order for participation to be effective, uh, it doesn't require mere consultation, but requires consent. This has always been our argument. Effective participation means that people's decisions are respected as part of that process. And if they say yes or no, then that decision has to be respected. Right? Human Rights Committee, uh, astoundingly in my view, because they're usually much more conservative than the Inter-American Court, said the same thing. Not only that, but said it applies in the case of minorities and indigenous peoples. So we'll see how that one plays out as the years go by as well. Same thing with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Consent is required in the case of indigenous peoples. Uh, and again, this case was in the context of forced expulsions from protected areas in, in Kenya. Very, very important decision, which uh, they, in fact, cut and paste large parts of the Sarah Market Judgment into their own decision. Um, as I said, there's a case on protected areas going through the commission now, which may end up in the court, and hopefully they'll cut and paste all that stuff back into their own judgment <laughs> later on as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that the impact assessment process is actually crucial because decisions about whether a project will have significant impacts uh, and therefore require consent is largely determined by the impact assessment process itself. So we need to make sure that indigenous peoples have a right to participate in impact assessment processes because if they don't, oftentimes we get horribly wrong decisions coming out of them. Uh, I can give you an example from my own country where they did an impact assessment on building a ski resort on a mountain. Uh, and the mountain is a sacred mountain to about nine Māori tribes who live around the mountain. And they had a very nice anthropologist who came in and did a study saying that they only use this mountain up to such and such a point. Therefore, you can build above that point because nobody's using it. Now, the reason nobody's using it is that's the most sacred part of the mountain. Right? So if you followed that impact assessment, they would have been building in the most sacred part of the mountain. If they'd spent five minutes talking to anybody who lived around there, they would have found out that's why nobody goes up there. Right? Uh, that's not even an extreme example. I could come up with worse ones. So the, according to the court, the purpose of the impact assessment is not only to have an objective measure of possible impacts on land and people, but also to ensure that members of the Saramaka are aware of the possible risks, uh, including environmental and health risks, in order that the proposed activity or development uh, is accepted by them. Um, the court's therefore tying this to this effective participation standard as well. So I don't think the court has explicitly said there's a right to participate in impact assessment, but I think it has otherwise said it. Uh, it becomes more apparent when you start looking at uh, impact assessments have to be done with respect for the traditions and culture of the people themselves. Well, if they're not involved in it, I don't really see how they're going to decide whether it's done in accordance with traditions or, or culture. Um, and again, this is an interpretation judgment. The impact assessments need to address the cumulative impacts of uh, existing and future projects as well, whether they're large or small scale or otherwise. Right? Uh, in particular, to, dis to assess whether these cumulative effects will affect survival, and therefore whether the project is permissible or impermissible. Um, this is where they're starting to read the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity into all of this. So. The, ES, the, the impact assessment itself has to conform to relevant international standards uh, as well as respect the traditions and culture of the Saramaka. Now the court explicitly identified something called the Aquadome Guidelines 
which were developed by the Convention on Biological Diversity as a way of um, supporting state parties to that convention to build these ideas into their own impact assessment regimes. Um, there were a number of states who didn't like this, so they're called voluntary guidelines. So in case you didn't get it with the guidelines, you get it with the voluntary. These are not binding, right? <laughs> they made sure everybody understood this was not binding. Um, these, uh, these guidelines are actually a book that's about this thick that were developed in close collaboration with indigenous people's representatives uh, in the working group on Article 8J and related articles. So there is substantial indigenous input into the content of these things in the first place. And for me, they're extremely important uh, and a very useful way of thinking about impact assessment as it relates to indigenous peoples. Um, so the court specifically identified this in a footnote. You know, I think the next step would be for us to try and then build some of that into the substance of the next judgment, uh, which we are encouraging the court to do. But I think it provides enough of a platform for arguing some of these things in future cases at any rate. Um, again, the ESIA identifies and determines a lot of the ways we think about whether a project is permissible, and if so, how. So getting it right is crucial part of this process. For instance, whether a project is necessary. Now, what does that mean? Necessary doesn't mean that someone has said we have to have this. It means, is there no other way of doing this project? Is there a less restrictive way of thinking about this project? You can do a project in a way that's less restrictive from a human rights perspective without necessarily abandoning the project itself. Is it proportional? Does it externalize all the costs onto one set of people versus another? Does it affect their cultural integrity, which would be a disproportionate impact? There's a lot of different ways of thinking about this, right? Um, whether consent is required. Is it a large-scale project that will have a major or significant impact? Could it affect the integrity of their territory? This is all going to come out of the impact assessment process. Uh, and we've been having, I think now, at least me, a 12-year argument with the World Bank about whether indigenous peoples have a right to participate in impact assessments. Uh, and it's still not explicitly recognized in any of the bank uh, policies. Uh, and again, we get the strange results like build on top of the mountain, it's okay, right? Um, I think it's important to remember that ILO 169, which is a, the only presently binding international convention on indigenous peoples, does have an article that says impact assessments shall be done in cooperation with the people's concerns. So this idea is not a new one. Uh, this convention was adopted in 1989. Uh, it's only been ratified by 21 states so far, the majority of whom are in the Americas. But still, the, the notion that uh, impact assessments should be participatory, uh, and in the case of the course judgment, conform to the customs and traditions of the people themselves, uh, is not particularly a new one. Um, we had argued that impact assessments should include specific human rights impact assessments as well. That would be going through a process of assessing to what extent the project impacted on specific internationally guaranteed rights. Uh, the court, for whatever reason, decided not to talk about that. Um, although you could argue some of this is implicit again in the social impact assessment, at least if it's done properly. Right? Um, the Inter-American Commission, however, has picked up on this again in this report on indigenous <coughs> lands. Um, and a very helpful statement, in my view, that says we shouldn't see these, assess these assessments only as project planning instruments, but as a ways of identifying what rights will be affected and how. And that means explicitly considering the impact on specific rights as part of the impact assessment process. Um, some of the uh, financial institutions do this now. The IFC has run a patchily applied an impact assessment process for human rights. Uh, and some private sector bodies do in my view, a half-baked attempt at it. But the idea is gaining some amount of currency, and I think if we can push those ideas forward a bit more through some of this jurisprudence, it will uh, uh, help in those dialogues with the private sector and others as well. Okay, I'm almost done. There's a case pending at the commission now called the Kalina and Lokono Peoples versus Suriname. Uh, it was filed in 2007 in January. Uh, citing violations of 21, 25, 1, 2, and 3, the same as in Saramaka, uh, in relation to the failure of Suriname to recognize their, their rights to their territory. Uh, 
uh, an active violation of their rights through the granting of bauxite mining concessions, offshore oil uh, leases, <coughs> the establishment of three national parks in their territory, uh, and alienation of lands in indigenous communities to uh, individuals who use these areas as vacation homes. They're on the beach, so they all have their vacation houses on the beach. Yeah? Um, it's seeking the titling of the territory, including the coastal and marine areas, uh, which to my knowledge has not been done in the inter-American system before, although it has been part of uh, domestic cases, particularly in Australia, New Zealand, and, and Papua New Guinea. Um, restitution of lands incorporated in protected areas. I usually get some very dirty looks from our friends at the big environmental organizations when we talk about this one. Um, and also the lands that have been alienated to individuals and then damages from the mining concessions as well. Uh, one of the reserves covers about 50% of their territory. Uh, it was established without notifying them. They found out about it a year later when a mining company showed up saying we have a permit to do bauxite mining inside the nature reserve. Uh, <coughs> law, law of Suriname makes no provision for their rights to hunt, fish, farm, do uh, cultural activities, spiritual activities in the reserve. Uh, and in fact, criminalizes those activities. If they're caught picking a flower, they can be put in jail for eight months. If they're caught picking a flower twice, it's five years. Yet, BHP Billiton can have a large scale bauxite mine in there without doing an environmental impact assessment in a category one nature reserve. So it was declared admissible in October 2007, uh, which is lightning speed for the Inter-American Commission. Um, and the Commission said in its admissibility report that there are facts in there which, if proven, would tend to establish violations of the Convention. Uh, and they specifically mentioned some of those facts are the establishment of the nature reserves and the denial of indigenous people's rights within those nature reserves. So in this, this, in my mind, means that the Commission is fully willing to consider these issues on the merits once it gets around to issuing or even writing a merits report in the case. Um, so I think we will get some treatment of how protected areas need to be uh, thought about from a human rights perspective, uh, which has only happened so far in the African Commission, and that was really about uh, expulsion of people from protected areas rather than the manner in which they're established or managed. So it is a slightly different issue. Uh, and again, the, the question of uh, offshore marine areas of indigenous territories as well. Uh, given that the IUCN has said that uh, offshore and um, coastal and marine protected areas should be increased by, I think it's 13%, or, or should cover 13% of the uh, surface of the world in the next 10 years or something like that. Again, most of these areas are in indigenous uh, areas as well. So I have a number of questions at the end, which are just things that I was thinking about and decided to write down. <laughs> so the first one, is it necessary to deny indigenous people's ownership rights over their territories or parts of those territories uh, in order to achieve public interest nature conservation or specific species protection measures? Uh, are there less intrusive ways of achieving those public interest objectives? Uh, I don't think anybody would deny that it's in the public interest to conserve nature and biodiversity and uh, protect sea turtles or whatever they happen to be, right? But are there less intrusive ways of doing that than stripping indigenous peoples of their rights in the process? Um, there are examples around the world of where governments have negotiated conservation agreements with indigenous peoples that establish specific management plans over parts or all of their territory without denying that indigenous peoples own those areas. There's an example in Bolivia, there's a number in New Zealand, there's a couple in Australia. Um, there's some in the United States where protected parts of national parks have been returned to Native Americans as well. So there are examples of where it is possible to negotiate such public interest considerations without going to such extreme measures. Now, if people say no, you then go to the next step of saying, well, it should then be involuntary, and that's another question. Um, is it proportionate that indigenous peoples experience the vast majority of negatives, whereas others get the vast majority of benefits. Uh, in the case of these national parks in Suriname, there are tourism companies who make a lot of money out of taking people from the US and Canada to go see sea turtles. Uh, indigenous peoples are shot at if they go near these beaches where the sea turtles lay eggs. Uh, some of them have been tied to trees in the forest overnight by forest guards who are protecting sea turtles from indigenous peoples. <laughs> 
Uh, now, the Kalina and Lakono don't eat sea turtles. Sometimes they take some of their eggs, but they've been doing so for thousands of years, and there are still sea turtles there. Uh, the people killing the sea turtles in this area are shrimp boats owned by powerful politicians who live in town, who don't have turtle excluders on their nets. I've talked to people, I won't mention from who, its first initial is C, its second one is I, who say that it's politically easier to blame indigenous people for this than it is to go after the politicians and their shrimp boats. Um, to what extent can culturally significant or spiritual activities be restricted inside these nature reserves? So you may say you can't hunt monkeys on Tuesday, but can you say you can't go worship at the graves of your ancestors? That's essentially criminalized now in Turnham, and all of their most important sacred sites are in these protected areas. And there's more than 150 of them. Is there a right to restitution that would apply to protected areas or lands incorporated in protected areas? Well, the Inter-American Court has said indigenous peoples do have a right to restitution of lands taken without their consent, uh, including where those lands are held by private individuals, including where those lands are protected by bilateral investment guarantee treaties, uh, including recently in a case against Paraguay where there was a protected area that was privately owned the court ordered that it be restituted to indigenous peoples. Does this now apply to publicly owned protected areas? Uh, and in particular, what does this mean, given that 80% of the protected areas in the Americas are on indigenous lands, including in this country? A very high proportion of protected areas are in fact on indigenous lands, precisely because indigenous peoples have been very effective at protecting those lands in the first place. Do we then go through a process of returning lands to 80% of protected areas in the Americas? This is going to be extremely contentious. Um, the good thing is that this actually complies with international conservation policy, particularly as developed by the IUCN and the World Parks Congress, which explicitly said that indigenous lands should be returned by 2013. I don't think they've done any yet, but uh, we still have what, another year and a half to do it. Uh, so at least the, the policy consensus is that these are valid issues that need to be addressed. Uh, they're also being discussed in a working group on protected areas at the Convention on Biological Diversity as well. Uh, we've developed a work program which doesn't include anything about restitution. Uh, but it does include a statement that uh, indigenous people's rights should be protected and guaranteed in accordance with national law and applicable international obligations. Now, in my mind, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court is interpreting applicable international obligations, uh, and they sh therefore should be part of the logic in the CBD. It's not at present, however. Um, I think it's particularly relevant given that the CBD basically refuses to talk about human rights. And it's a bit like the World Bank who says, that's somebody else's business, not ours. We don't do that stuff. Go away. Don't talk to us about that. Right? Not that there are not human rights norms incorporated in the CBD decisions. There are. Uh, they tend to be in CBD language, which may be more appropriate in that context or not. But there's no guarantee that these activities should not violate international guaranteed human rights. Which then raises the question, if you're talking about implementing the CBD versus implementing, in this case, the American Convention on Human Rights, should one take precedence over the other? How does that work in practice? Particularly when you have different government departments who do these things, uh, some of whom are usually much more well financed than others, uh, or have more political backing than others. Is there a hierarchy of norms in this context or not? Um, how do we deal with all of these issues in the context of the current climate change mitigation measures being developed, particularly RED, uh, reduced emissions from forest degradation, deforestation and forest degradation, something like that, uh, which is getting a lot of international attention and there's potentially a lot of international money going to be put into uh, protecting forests as carbon sinks. And again, most of these areas tend to be in indigenous areas. Uh, we've seen laws adopted in Indonesia, we've seen laws being adopted in the Americas, which essentially deny indigenous people's rights in these areas that will be declared carbon reserves. And then there are others who will make money by trading carbon uh, on an international market. So how does this all work? Does a global interest in mitigating climate change override the rights of indigenous peoples or others? I think about it, and I want to just think differently. And that's the end. I'm sorry I went on so long. I didn't know that's the one.
anybody have any questions? 120, how are you feeling about your I'm okay. I can go in, 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 in about 20 minutes. Well, and also, some people may have to leave the class and start at 30, so don't do that. Do you want to handle the questions first? It's easier if you just call on people. No, I know. Go ahead. Why don't you start? Just do one at a time. One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jules Alexander. I'm, I'm a Colombian. I have a question because you were talking about the the way how it can be extended and uh, certain rights of indigenous people to abolitionists. So I want to ask you, do you think that under any circumstances it is possible to extend indigenous people right to other communities, including abolitionists? I am asking you this because in Colombian co uh, context, our constitutional court uh, mm -hmm. has extended the rights recognizing the International Labor Organization 169 Convention to Afro-descend. So we have the same kind of right that indigenous people say. As long as we meet certain requirements of our community. Do you think that under any circumstances it should be extended to our community? Well, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I worked on the Saramaka case for going on 15 years now. Uh, and part of the argument was is that the Saramaka have the same rights as indigenous people. So I would say yes, but it depends who we're talking about. Um, in the case of Colombia, yeah. I mean, the state, even the Colombian state recognizes that uh, Cimarrones, uh, Afro-Colombians, some Afro-Colombians, but not all, yeah. uh, have the same rights as indigenous people. Ecuador does the same. Brazil does the same. So there, there are, in my view, a category of what some call Afro-descendants who meet the criteria also of being tribal peoples, either in the context of ILO 169 uh, or in the context of the Saramaka judgment. So. For some Afro-descendants, I would say, yes, it makes sense. For others, it makes no sense whatsoever and shouldn't be done. Uh, again, Afro-descendants is a category that's a very large category. And again, Barack Obama and the rest of the communities in Jamaica, uh, rich lawyers in New York, I mean, there's a whole range of different people who fit in the category of Afro-descendants. Uh, my argument has always been saying all Afro-descendants should be treated the same. It's not only stupid, it's counterproductive as well. Right? In the case of... Afro-descendants who also qualify as tribal peoples, which certainly in Colombia is the case, Ecuador is the case, um, Brazil is the case, French Guyana is the case, Suriname is the case, yes, I would say yes. In other contexts, I would say no. Uh, we have the same discussion with those who want to say all local communities should have the same rights as indigenous peoples too. It, it drives me nuts. It is, it, it, it's just not helpful. The last one I heard is all natural resource dependent local communities should have the same rights as indigenous peoples. And I think everybody's natural resource dependent. What are you talking about? <laughs> the, we're, we're all got electricity in here. We all came on a bus or a train or something. And we're all natural resource. Do you mean those who live in a subsistence way? What do you mean by that? In, in, in the back there? Yes. Uh, I mean, in your mind, what do you think will be the impact of uh, the... the the participation as an expert witness of James Anaya in the Ecuador case because I asked him this because he was not quite clear before as if the UN declaration and the Ecuador Convention were the same regarding the, the not participation and if it was mandatory. And I think there he approached much more into say that they tend to say the same. So if you think that threshold will be uh, a new threshold for the system? Um. Well, I, I watched his testimony at the court, and, and I also talked with him about it. I don't think his view is that there, it's not mandatory. I think his view is that, um, and consistent with the court, is whether consent is required is really based on the nature of the interests that are affected by the project. Consultation, participation with the objective of reaching an agreement is always required, whether it's ILO 169, whether it's the Declaration, whether it's uh, Saramaka. The Declaration has certain provisions which talk about consent, whereas ILO 169 only has one and then undermines it in three subparagraphs, right? Um, his view is that the, the Declaration requires consent, but not in all situations, right? Um, now, in, in the hearing before the Inter-American Court, they didn't need to go into all of that. They could have just said, you've already done this in Saramaka, why are we spending all this time on this, right? In fact, somebody texted him that before the hearing. <laughs> why are you talking about all this? We've already done it, right? So, 
Uh, the court could follow Saramaka and apply the same logic for certain large-scale projects that could affect integrity. And in my view, that's Sariaku for sure. Uh, consent is required. Was consent obtained? Was it not consent obtained? How was it obtained? Who did it? Under what circumstances? These are the type of questions they would then, then need to get into. Right? One, two, three. Okay. I have, um, I'll raise more questions. Uh, number one, um, so you, were, you were talking about the about the spiritual component, right? In the in the that uh, part of the tribes. Um, I'm wondering if in the decisions of the Inter-American Court in such cases like uh, Adamo Iwana, do you feel that the court actually reaches a, a level of the integral reparation, like that that measures of reparation that the court establishes? Do you think that they get to the, to the point of um, solving the spiritual conflict that this violation of human rights originated? Um, well, let me take a couple of things. The, the, the first thing is I think the court has perhaps gone further than most of the human rights bodies in recognizing these multiple aspects, including in the context of reparations, uh, including the spiritual aspect. When we want to, which is also in the case, was, was one of those that did that. Um, I think it goes wrong in, in that the reparations ordered by the court are often quite meager, um, for right or for better or worse. I don't know whether they should be ordering large amounts of money and other things or shouldn't. But, um, so I think they're they're constrained in, in that they tend to be quite conservative in the reparations measures they order. Uh, I think their jurisprudence is anything but conservative, and I think it had a lot to do with a certain judge from Brazil who's no longer there anymore. Um, did they do it properly in Moiwana? I think they did, yeah. Um, I mean, bear in mind, we're also talking to judges who tend to be from um, the elite in Latin America, who have heard about indigenous peoples or heard about some of these things, but don't necessarily understand it either, right? So uh, there's a lot of uh, um, work required by both indigenous peoples and uh, lawyers and advocates who represent them to try and explain these things properly to the judges so that they do understand them. Uh, when oftentimes their natural inclination is to go, that sounds weird, I'm not going to do that, right? Um, so I think yes and no is the answer. Okay, and the other two questions are related to um, Kalina and O'Connell cases. Uh, it's very hard to keep a track on those cases because, in that particular case, because it's still in in the admissibility part. So the only thing that we can find is the initial report. So what is the uh, litigation strategy that the that the state is having right now? Is it following the same line that it that it was using with Alobotoy, Moiwana, uh, Saramaga, or do you feel that it's being more compliant now with the? with the uh, system. And number two there, why do you think the commission... Why do you think the commission has not started <laughs> precautionary measures? That's it. Well, let me do the second one first, because nobody asked them to do it. Okay? Um, so they, did, they didn't order precautionary measures in that case, because nobody asked them to. Right? Um, there's a very long reason for that, that we, we wouldn't ask them for. Um, the first one, Suriname strategy. Strategy one is stick your head in the ground and pretend, hope it'll go away. Um, strategy two is to argue that some of these eight communities are not indigenous, whereas some are. Uh, and some of them aren't indigenous because they have houses, running water, jobs, and phones. So again, it's this, this loincloth idea of, uh, you know, if, if you don't look like someone who has a bow and arrow and runs around in the bush chasing whatever it is, you're not a real Indian. And that's essentially their argument. There's a group of these guys who are not real Indians, and a group of them who are. Uh, and you should only talk about the rights of those who are, and not those who aren't. Um, and then there's also there's you know, issues of, of timing on this. So protected areas were all established prior to Suriname's ratification of the American Convention. You know, so part of its argument has been, you know, you're, you're barred. You have no jurisdiction over these protected areas because it was all before we accepted the Convention. Right? Um, that's essentially their argument. They, they don't take these processes very seriously until it gets to the court, and then they all get in panic and decide they have to do something about it. Now, Suriname is not the same as all other governments. You know, the U.S. government, for instance, will bury you in paper. Uh, even cases where they argue that the declaration is non-binding, we don't have to do it anyway. They'll have nine lawyers at the State Department, and 12 at the Justice Department, and five at Interior, 
bury you in paper for the next five years. So it depends on which government we're talking about. In, in Suriname, they have two people who basically do this. Uh, it's their part-time job. Uh, and neither one of them knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Two and three, or just three and two. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the new prior consultation law in Peru, especially with regard to um, what some issues might be in implementation, just the practicalities of the law. Um, well, okay. First of all, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on the prior consultation law in Peru. I get lots of emails about it, half of which I read and half of which I don't. Um, I paid attention to it to the extent that the Constitutional Court has rendered certain judgments that uh, cite Saramaka uh, and talk about the distinction between consultation and consent and when it should happen. Uh, I don't know exactly where they settled on that in the consultation law itself because I haven't seen the final draft of it. Uh, I know there was an extremely rancorous political debate in Peru about that. Um, Congress in particular didn't want to send it up to the President to, to sign off on it. Um, implementation issues, well, the good news is that the executive actually supported it, which is the thing that's supposed to implement it. Um, but we'll run into the perennial issues with any consultation or consent process. Who has to be consulted? Who consents? How do you decide that? Who decides that? When does it have to start? Uh, what is the nature of the process once it's started? How long does it have to go on for? I mean, th these are all the same questions, irrespective of whether we're talking about Peru or Ecuador or Australia or the U.S. or wherever it happens to be. Right? Uh, what happens if you have, as there is in the U.S., you have a tribal government which is recognized by the U.S. under a tribal constitution, and you have a traditional government that's recognized by half the people who live on the reservation. So the people themselves don't agree on who it is that represents them in any particular situation, right? Uh, and that's not strange. You know, uh, you put any group of people together, they're not always going to agree all of the time, right? Uh, indigenous people, non-indigenous, not everybody agrees all the time. So there are a lot of these issues that have to be worked through. Uh, I think at the international level we've been trying to establish some broad parameters and getting into some, some more detailed process requirements. But I think the important point for me is that these processes must be guided by the traditions and customs of the people concerned. So the process is not going to be the same in each case anyway, even whether you're talking about the Andes versus the Amazon in Peru, or one part of the Amazon versus another part of the Amazon in Peru, or even sometimes one side of the river versus the other side of the river. So, I mean, I have some sympathy for, for World Bank people and, and oil company people who go, I don't know what to do about this, right? Um, because it's not, some of the questions are complicated and some of them are very sensitive uh, internally as well, so it's not always that simple. Um, but again, the specifics of the law, I'd have to go read it again to, to get into it. Thank you. Um, this is incredibly elementary after all of these really sophisticated questions, but um, can you explain how um, a group is determined to be indigenous and more broadly, how and why um, did indigenous groups become this I guess special class, I don't know if that's the right term, but you probably know what I mean. Um, okay. Uh, I, I used to work for something called the World Council of Indigenous Peoples, and, and my, my first misfortune when I worked there was having to sit through an endless discussion at the UN about how to define the term indigenous. Uh, and this discussion went on for 20 years, and the UN <laughs> said, it's not possible to do this, and it's not desirable to do it, so we're not. Um, which is not usually helpful either, right? Um, the only really legal definition of the term indigenous is in the uh, ILO Convention number 169, which has two categories, uh, indigenous peoples and tribal peoples. And the difference between the two is indigenous requires priority in time uh, in relation to some sort of colonial intervention. So those who were in the Americas before uh, whoever it was who came there first. Uh, those who were in New Zealand before whoever it was who came there first. Uh, tribal peoples, however, do not require that priority in time. Uh, in common with indigenous peoples, it requires uh, a specific relationship to territory, uh, distinct cultural, historical, sometimes linguistic 
uh, and other characteristics that make them different from the broader population of the state. Uh, and one can be more or less, a lot of indigenous peoples have lost their language due to assimilation or whatever it happens to be. So we won't require that you have to speak your own language in certain instances if you meet the other, uh, uh, other uh, requirements or criteria is probably a better word. Um, the other one is that they live wholly or, in par or partially in accordance with their own customs and norms. Uh, this is why this tribal people's thing works for the Saramaca, it works for Afro-Colombia, or at least some Afro-Colombians. Eh? They maintain their traditional forms of governance and relationship to land and customary laws as it applies to lands and all of that. Uh, what was the last part of the question? Um, why how, is there a special category? Yeah, how, how that came to be and why is it? Well, I mean, we have you know, women's rights and children's rights and rights of disabled people. Uh, certain individuals or groups are considered to have different needs and characteristics based upon their own uh, particular needs and characteristics, which means they may have to be treated differently uh, in order to be equally protected by the law or for some other reason. Right? Um, if we look at indigenous property rights, where do they come from? Do they come from grants by the state or do they come from indigenous people's own laws and customs? Well. Human rights law says these rights derive from indigenous people's own laws and customs. So that automatically makes indigenous peoples different from others who derive their property rights from formal grants by the state. Um, indigenous people's property rights tend to be collective. And in fact, in almost all cases, they are collective. Whereas if you go around here and knock on everybody's door and ask, do you want collective rights or an individual title? I'm pretty sure I know what they'll say, right? So indigenous peoples have different needs and characteristics. Relationship to land is another one. Um, some people would say there's a historical marginalization, there's historical discrimination that needs to be remedied. Others will say indigenous peoples are peoples with an S, and all peoples have the right to self-determination, whereas all people don't. So indigenous peoples have different rights simply because they are something different as international law understands that term. Um, I remember going to the Vienna Conference, uh, World Conference on Human Rights in 1993, and we were all wearing a shirt with a big S on it. I still have it somewhere. And they stuck us in the basement. They wouldn't let us in the main room. But we all walked around with it. Why? Because the states were all trying to say indigenous people, or indigenous populations, or indigenous groups, or indigenous communities. Why? Because those things don't have the right to self-determination. Indigenous peoples do. Right? So the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples adopted in the uh, UN General Assembly in, in 2007 emphatically states in Article 3, indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination. Therefore, indigenous peoples are already something different than everybody else and have a special status and, 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 and rights that flow from that status that others do not necessarily have. Uh, minorities do not have a right to self-determination unless they can also be defined as a people. Minorities have individual rights to language, culture, and religion. It's not the same thing. Indigenous peoples' rights framework is, is fundamentally different and it's framed by this right to self-determination. And you can put almost every article in the Declaration under one of those headings, under the right to freely determine political status or the right to freely pursue economic, social, and cultural development. Uh, I've done it before. You can make a list of all of these things. Yeah? Um, so the, the nature of the rights themselves are not the same as the rights that apply to individuals. Uh, and that, in some cases, particularly when we're interpreting general human rights treaties in the context of indigenous peoples, means thinking about those rights based upon the specific needs and characteristics and the difference that indigenous peoples have in relation to non-indigenous peoples. Right? Like what's the difference between women and men? What's the difference between children and adults? What's the difference between uh, um, uh, disabled people and, and non-disabled? You know, I mean, there's a whole range of reasons why international law creates these different boxes. Right? Uh, it also plays out in domestic law as well. I mean, if you look at the US, and indigenous nations have special status under US law subject to the plenary power of the Congress, who can take it all away whenever it wants to, but nonetheless there is a, a, you know, a special status based upon a different historical relationship between the state and indigenous peoples, among other things as well. Right? Yeah? Yeah, I'd like to ask about the definition. Let's let's I just want to I want to because our time is beginning because your time is beginning I'm to run to short. Minutes, yeah. uh, why don't we call this as the last question? About, about the definition of indigenous people. Oh, no. What it means. Uh -huh. Sorry, go on. <laughs> we talked about the definition we got to the prehistoric people. And all the definition 
mostly talk about the evolution of indigenous people in the Americas and sometimes about uh, Africa. What about applying the definition for people in the Middle East that we cannot talk about prehistory uh, period, like the Palestinian people? Can you call them indigenous people? Well, the Palestinians have specifically decided not to call themselves indigenous, as have Tibetans, as have other groups as well. Why? Well, you're indigenous in relation to somebody else. So, Tibetans will say, we're Tibetans. We're not indigenous Tibetans in relation to China. So, we want to maintain that historical independence that we believe we've always had. And we believe that defining ourselves as indigenous is counterproductive in particular because indigenous rights are intended to be exercised within existing states. And there is a right of secession only in extraordinarily limited circumstances, uh, by which time people would have picked up guns anyway, and it, it, the letter of the law would be irrelevant. So uh, there are tactical reasons why people have done it and why they haven't done it. Um, but there are groups in North Africa, in Asia, in Africa, uh, which is where the term, the definition of tribal peoples actually came from. It was developed to deal with those who are indigenous in one way or another in Asia, in Africa, and elsewhere, uh, who could not prove priority in time vis-a-vis -vis other population groups. Right? So this category of tribal peoples, which is now being applied in the Americas to, to Maroons or Samarones or whatever you want to call them, uh, was originally developed to deal with that situation in India, in China, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, in North Africa with uh, what they call Berbers and others in uh, Central Africa and Southern Africa, right? That's my comment. Yeah. Oh, I think I need to go. <laughs>